So and I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Claren Cafe on, the tip, on this uh, topic, creating pedagogical corpora with annotation of sensitive content and offensive language which, about the Crow uh, project. Um, well, the Claren Cafe is a, an informal and interactive space for discussion where researchers, lecturers, students and experts can meet to share experiences and insights that have a potential relevance for the activities and the developments within the context of uh, Clarin. Today's organizers for this Clarin Cafe are Tanara Tsingano Kuhn, Spela Arar Holt, Carola Tiberius, Christina Koppel, Rina Ziel Rishin and Isto Kosem. Um, my name is Henk van den Heuvel, a uh, member of the Claren uh, Board of Directors, your host for today. Technical support is offered by David Bourdon, and it is relevant for you to know that this event is uh, recorded for further dissemination purposes. Um, and if you have questions or comments, please use the chat for this. So here's a schedule for uh, this afternoon. I will start uh, with a brief opening, telling you about a bit more about Claren and Claren Eric and what uh, Claren is about. And then we will have an introduction of the Crowl project by Tanaro, Tanara. Um, and then after the next half hour, there will be challenges in data preparation and the manual corpse annotation presented by Spela and uh, Carole. Then we will have time for question and answering, and then we go to the second part on game and data management, uh, which will be presented by Christina, Rina, and Istok. And then there will be time for another round of uh, question and, and answers. So I'm happy to tell you something about Claren, which is a, an abbreviation of the common language resource in technology infrastructure. Um, we have an ERIC status uh, as of 2012, and are an S3 landmark since 2016. Um, what we do is to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond. Um, and that is access to language data in written, spoken or multimodal form and to advanced tools to explore the data. Um, and what uh, the idea is that we have an environment to do this, which is a single sign-on environment so that you can uh, link on to all the um, elements of the infrastructure with uh, just one sign-on. Um, Clown serves as an ecosystem for knowledge and sharing and training. So it's not only that we have this infrastructure where we have uh, data and tools, but we also see ourselves of share, as a community for sharing knowledge and, and, and um, providing training. Cleon is one of the European research infrastructures in the uh, SSH open cluster, so social sciences and humanities, and actively involved in shaping the EOSC. Um, there's a link to our value preposition, which you can have a look at if you want, and this presentation will be shared later, of course. Claren is a federative organization consisting of uh, 70 centers uh, all over Europe, in fact, um, depending on uh, a number of member states. Uh, and you see the member states here. And we have two observers from, from Switzerland and the UK and the third party at the United States. Um, there are several centers. So we have B centers, which are data centers providing data to the infrastructure, C centers providing metadata, and K centers, which are knowledge centers uh, providing knowledge uh, to the infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, so the um, architecture is like this. Um, there are metadata provided about resources. These resources are then um, made visible in the la virtual language observatory through a harvesting process. Uh, from there, the language uh, resources can be used for data analysis on the switchboard. What Claren offers are high quality and interoperable data, tools, models, and metadata with a high level of accessibility um, and active collaboration uh, in a community uh, where knowledge exchange is uh, essential. Um, for this, we offer annual conference. Next conference will be in Barcelona in October. Events such one as, as this one, Claren Cafes, all kinds of workshops. We have teaching and training and 
the knowledge centers, which I already mentioned on all kinds of topics. Uh, with a look at the uh, website of Claren, you can find all these knowledge centers and uh, what their expertise is. So further, we have uh, a number of committees, uh, one on legal and ethical issues, which is very relevant when it comes to sharing resources, um, one on standards and interoperability, and one on user involvement. We have a number of grants which you can apply for, uh, mobility grants, um, and Claren ambassadors uh, on several topics which can, who can uh, attend uh, workshops or conferences and tell you relevant things that Claren has, has, has to offer. Uh, for specific um, uh, events. And we have a, a number of Claren resource families where we group uh, language resources and tools and lexica on various topics where you have a handy overview of, uh, of a list of resources that you can use when you're working or interested in a specific field. And so one of the Claren language resource families that we will be addressing uh, today is uh, the Crowell LL uh, project. So you can have a look at uh, what we do with uh, uh, some handy uh, uh, user-friendly information on our impact stories and Tour de Clarin, which uh, are very stimulating to, to see what is going on in uh, the Clarin uh, uh, community uh, and get inspired. I think it's time for me to hand over to you, Tanara, to introduce the Crow uh, project. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Hank. Thank you for the introduction. Um, we are very happy to be here this afternoon to share with you a little bit of our project. I'm Tanara Zindanukun from the Research Center for General and Applied Linguistics, Selga Utec, uh, at the University of Coimbra. And uh, we are going to talk today about this project, the CROW project, which is part of uh, a research that has been going on actually for a couple of years already, well, over a couple of years, since 2019. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this, the origin of the project and uh, what we want to do, and then I will um, hand over to my colleagues. But before we start, there's something important to know, which is this disclaimer. We would like to say that um, this presentation contains content that may be considered offensive or sensitive, such as racism, sexism, homophobia, pornography, death, illness, or otherwise upsetting material. This content does not reflect the opinions and beliefs of the researchers involved in this project or their institutions. Uh, we also want to say that we have um, approval from the Ethics Committee uh, at the European Academic Center for carrying out this research. So as I said, we've been working on this for a while already. We all met at INET Collect, which is a, a cost action that stands for uh, European Network for Combining Language Learning with Crowdsourcing Techniques. And, uh, we met actually in 2018, most of us. I mean, I came a little bit later to the, to the uh, um, action. It started in 2017. Um, and uh, in 2019, in the beginning of the year, February, I suppose, um, we went to Brussels for this Crowdfest. Crowdfest, it's a type of a hackathon where some of the members were there for a couple of days to brainstorm ideas and develop methodologies using crowdsourcing uh, for language learning um, project ideas and also things related to uh, data protection, business ideas. So there were different areas. And um, I went there. With, the idea was that we would pitch an idea for all the members there. And some people would, if interested, join you and we would work together for the following days. I went there together with my colleague Peter Decker, who at the time was working at the Dutch Language Institute. And we pitched the idea and uh, we got uh, Rina, who is here today with us from Israel, and also Branislava Shandri from Serbia, who left the uh, group some two years ago uh, she had a baby and she left academia, uh, but she was uh, also part of this, the origin of the group. 
So um, the idea that I had was related to scale and crowdsourcing. I'll give you details in a minute, but before, bear with me, because before I get there, I just want to show a little bit about scale. Um, you probably know, but for those of you who don't know scale, scale is sketch engine for language learning. It's a language learning tool that provides automatic summary of corpus data. It is for free, so it's not a corpus tool for you to upload your corpus and do corpus analysis, but it is already, uh, it, it's got different scale corpora and you can do um, uh, language studies uh, on the fly from this uh, corpora. So currently there is a scale for uh, Czech, Russian, Italian, uh, Estonian, um english. english yeah of course english yes <laughs> so for the six languages um and uh scale basically what you get is you type in a word for instance result and you can get example sentences and i'm going to talk a little bit about example sentences why example sentences are important and why we want because the focus of our uh project is to create corpora for pedagogical uh, purposes, so for teaching learning, and this corpus, uh, this corpora are com comprise example sentences, right? So good dictionary examples, but not only dictionary, if we can uh, uh, broaden the idea and think of also for learning and in, in, in teaching purposes in general, they are characterized by five characteristics. They are natural, authentic, typical, informative and intelligible. So natural as if, okay, the, sen the sentence sounds, this example sounds like something I would encounter in my uh, regular language use. And we can get, get this kind of naturalness from authentic texts, right? So from corpora. Nowadays, in, in terms of dictionary making, there is no dispute. I mean, uh, the standard modern methodology uh, for, for lexicography uses corpora. But maybe not so much for also uh, teaching materials. That's not so widespread. Uh, then typicality refers to uh, showing the typical uh, behavior of the words in a context. So in terms of syntax, phraseology, um, in terms of informativeness, it would be important uh, that the example can provide you more information regarding senses and subsenses. Um, and also it's important that these uh, sentence, this, uh, sentences, these examples are self-contained. So uh, this con the, the context should be, under the content, sorry, should be understandable without the need for a wider context. And when we think of intelligible, uh, sentences to the users. We mean that sentences are not too long or do not contain complex syntax, syntax or rare or specialized vocabulary. Ideally, these would be the characteristics for ideally good dictionary examples. And then uh, sketch, the Sketch Engine team led by Adam Kilgariff uh, developed this Goodex configuration, which provides a way to uh, find this example according to this criteria. Uh, and Spella and Carol will talk a little bit more about it in their part about Goodex. But it's because of a Goodex configuration that it's possible to have the examples shown this, as it is displayed here, right? In order, uh, and these sentences from corpora and not order. Also, another thing that Scales provides uh, are word sketches which is the heart of sketch engine. And it means it shows the collocational and uh, uh, lexical pattern of the word. And for a, a, a word sketch, you need a sketch grammar. And in short, a sketch grammar, it's a directive that tells the system what to do, what to look for in the corpus and find the gram grammatical relations in terms of statistical calculations. This is put putting this very simply, right? And finally, uh, you can also have similar words, which is basically the thesaurus function from Sketch Engine. 
uh, which is also based on the sketch grammar. And why am I telling you that? Because my idea was, wow, we should have a scale for Portuguese, right? So what do we need for, sorry, what do we need for a scale for Portuguese? Okay, we need, or for any language, we need a big corpus, very large one, because we are going to extract some sentences based on this good X configuration criteria, and also in terms of uh, getting rid of some inappropriate uh, words, sentences containing inappropriate words, which is through a blacklist. Also, you need a sketch grammar, and I devised the sketch grammar in my uh, PhD, and also a good X configuration, which I also devised in my PhD. So I kind of have everything I need for uh, a PT uh, a scale for Portuguese. But then we have to remember that uh, for autonomous language learning tools um, with automatically created web corpus data, further corpus filtering is required. No offensive words or no sensitive content. And I just want to emphasize here the fact that SCAL is an autonomous language learning tool. So there is no mediation from teacher to give you some context or anything. It's people can, of course, teachers can use SCALs in their classes if they want to, but this is a self-learning tool. So we should be careful with that. And why am I saying that? Because, well, there is this classic example here. If we look up for ravenously on scale, uh, these are some of the examples. The second best example by the good X configuration that they use um, is already something that um, it's censored. But then you can go to the 13th, example and say that well maybe i don't know if it should be here you know dictionaries say that this idiom is offensive you know uh, so the point is even if you use a, a role-based approach which is the blacklist sometimes you might have some uh, examples there that shouldn't be there and this is also important to reinforce everything on scale is totally automatically created. So there is no human verification whatsoever. And then I thought, okay, so I have a corpus. I have, well, there is a corpus available. PT 1010 is very big. It's not mine. It's a, a, a sketch engine's team, but it's very big. We have a sketch grammar and a good X configuration, but we do know that sometimes there are some problems. So why not ask the crowd to help? And this, that was my idea. So let's have some kind of crowdsourcing to help people filter out sentences that are not appropriate for uh, language learning and teaching. And that was the, the, our task in CrowdFest uh, to create this crowdsourcing project to help to filter the corpus, namely to take the whole corpus and find a way to get rid of inappropriate sentences. So we, the, the research question that was then basing our research was, uh, how can web corpora be filtered for language learning purposes using crowdsourcing? And we followed, by that time, more people had joined us, namely Spela and Istok from Slovene. Uh, and also Taneke Schoenheim from the Dutch Language Institute, who unfortunately later uh, passed away. Um, and we were working then on this experiment using uh, Pybosa, which is a, a, a very well-known uh, crowdsourcing platform. Peter Decker, our colleague, was uh, an expert uh, at this uh, tool. And we created an, an experiment where we had a, a landing page and people would get there and select their language. We used, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of method here, but we automatically extracted sentences from corpora of four different languages. So Dutch, uh, Serbian, Slovene, and Portuguese. And the crowd was asked to select the sentences that they considered to be offensive for teaching learning language X. So 
learning Portuguese or uh, Estonia, uh, not, not Estonia at the time, sorry, Serbian or Slovene or Dutch. So we are going to have a, an interactive moment now and would like you to experience a little bit of what our crowd experienced. We need your help to filter examples from a retrieve from the web to make them suitable for English learning purposes, all right? So you'll see the question, the task is select the sentence or the sentences you find offensive for English learning material. Okay, so thank you very much for this voting. As you can see, it, there's no clear agreement or consensus in terms of what this is offensive or not to be an English, an English teaching material. Some of the lessons we learned from this exercise, well, this experiment, now it was your exercise, but we had the, the experiment with many respondents and uh, it was on for a period of time. We presented the results at uh, several conferences. We published paper. So we found out that automatic corpus cleaning, so the blacklist method, has some loss of valuable ma material because not always is a word offensive. At the same time, we found that some participants found some sentences offensive despite the absence of offensive words. We also realized that we should be more straightforward and, and give an exact task for the crowd. Because here, as you might have experienced, we said offensive, but there were some other types of problems that you might have encountered that you thought, okay, this is not adequate or not appropriate for learning, but there is no option here because it's just asking me to select offensive. And also we uh, found out that we needed to make it more um, appealing because the the Pibosa was basically what you did yeah a sentence and people would need to select so we said okay let's have let's try to increase user involvement and also in in general terms what we learned from this because this is then how we ended what we now call the phase one of our pro of our uh, project uh, when we use this traditional crowdsourcing uh, perspective and we wanted to filter out sentences from the corpus, from the corpora with the help from the crowd. But in the end, we wanted to create manually annotated uh, corpora, right? We want to create corpora for pedagogical purposes. And we found out that creating pedagogical corpora, it's challenging in at least two ways. Right, so it's not an easy task at all, because manual verifying l large amounts of texts is extremely time consuming, thus expensive. The very nature of language limits automatization of corpus verification, so many words are polysemic, and this is, for instance, some shortcomings to rule-based approaches. We also found out that problems identified as structural errors via uh, automatic error detection are not actual mistakes, but rather spelling and grammatical variation based on context of use. And most importantly, I would say that contextual, social, historical, and subjective aspects have a significant role in the determination of what sensitivity and offensiveness in language are. So we said, okay, Let's try to find a solution to streamline this human verification of examples. And this is when we came up with the uh, crowdsourcing uh, game idea. So in, very quickly, I just want to focus to show that we changed the, the purpose. So before, our purpose was to filter out. And now we want to label the sentences. So we want the crowd to... First of all, identify problematic sentences, but also to categorize the problems in those sentences. And uh, what we want to be able to do with these answers. We want to know that sentence X is considered to be problematic, sentence Y is not problematic, and sentence X is problematic because of this, this, and that. So in some, we want to label 
rights to corpora. So the purpose now it's different. We don't filter out anything. We leave everything on the corpus and we have labels so that the final users that we envisage, which are the same lexicographers, material developers, teachers can select or deselect the sentences according to their context and their needs. So a teacher knows uh, their classroom, they know what kind of examples they can use or not. A dictionary will know what type of examples they can have according to the policy uh, in the dictionary and so on and so forth. And also uh, all the ones that are labeled as non-problematic can be used for scale. And the label sentences we want to use uh, for a machine learning algorithm. So that will be um, stage three, but I'm going to go a bit faster here. And I want to go then to our PRO project. Uh, in 2022, we applied for uh, the Clearing Resources Family Funding Initiative, and we were very happy to know that we got it and we had the opportunity to carry out this project. So our objective was to create manually annotated corpora for teaching and learning purposes of Brazilian Portuguese, Dutch, Estonian, and Slovene. And as I said earlier, this uh, end users were lexicographers, language teachers, NLP researchers, and as well for the development of SCAL. Uh, our project was uh, structured in two stages. Stage one, data preparation, which will be uh, explained in more detail uh, very soon by Speller and Carol. And then stage two, game development, that when Rina, Cristina, and his talk will talk about this stage. From each stage, we had outcomes. So the outcomes from stage one were the manually annotated corpora themselves, the annotation guidelines in all the languages and also in English for people who don't speak uh, the languages and would like to apply this methodology to their own languages, and also the lemma list for extraction. So we created a lemma list to extract sentences from corpora and people can also follow that if they want to, uh, to apply for their own languages. And these are all available on Portulan Clearing. We also use this corpora as seed corpora in our game. That means the starting point for the crowdsource supported development of larger corpora, because that's the idea of our corpus, uh, sorry, of our game. The idea is that the game will help us enlarge the corpus and have further annotation. So our idea is that by including more participants in the process and we can streamline annotation and then we can have larger amounts of manually processed data. So we are going to ask the players to do what we did, but as uh, while they are playing a game. Uh, so the crowd game is a, a crowdsourcing based game for further corpus growth. And the code is available on GitHub as open access. And um, finally, um, our idea is that researchers wanting to create such an annotated corpora for their own language can choose either the expert approach, which is by following the annotation guidelines, or and the crowdsourcing technique with the game. And our future steps include a collection and analysis of the player's answers to draw some conclusions regarding how people judge offensive language and sensitive content. So some questions we would like to answer are, for instance, how much variability is there among people in terms of sentence judgment? Is there any factor that might contribute to this variability? What are the characteristics of the sentences considered by the crowd to be offensive, vulgar, or to have sensitive content? Is there a pattern? Do these characteristics vary among languages? So we need, we need people to play, and then we collect sentences, and we can analyze that. Uh, and once we are done, 
we will start uh, stage three, which is uh, the machine learning stage. And with that, I hand to you, Spella and Carol. Thank you. So yes, um, I will take over and in the next 25 minutes or so, Spella and I will present the methodology that we followed for the preparation of the data and the manual corpus annotation. Um, so yeah, our methodology for data preparation involved three key elements. First, the selection of the source corpora from which we extracted the, the example sentences, then the definition of the pedagogically oriented GoodEx configurations to identify the more pedagogically suited examples, and then third, the creation of lemma list that defined the sentences to be extracted from the corpora for manual annotation. I will discuss the selection of the source corpora as well as the definition of the pedagogically oriented GoodEx configurations. And then Sperla from the University of Ljubljana will take over and she will talk about the creation of the lemma list as well as the challenges that we faced in the manual annotations. So yes, for the selection of the source corpora, one of the crucial guidelines for choosing the source corpora was actually that they were, and at least in some part openly available. Um, this way, the data that we have created can be shared and reused by other researchers. And, um, and this is particularly important as one of the main uh, problems in the area of language resource development, and especially in the context of language learning, is the lack of open source material for many languages. So this slide summarizes uh, the source corpora that we have used for Dutch and Brazilian uh, Portuguese, we used the um, Dutch and Portuguese corpora from the timestamped JSI web corpus family. That is a family of web corpora that have been created by the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia for 18 languages, and uh, which consists of news articles which are obtained from a crawled list of RSS feeds. Both these Portuguese and the Dutch corpus are available in Sketch Engine and they cover the same time period from 2014 to 2021. For Dutch, we use the whole corpus, uh, so including material from the Netherlands and from Belgium. For Portuguese, we, re we restricted the corpus and only the text which uh, Brazil marked as a source country was selected as we are first developing trial for Brazilian Portuguese. For Estonian, we use the Estonian National Corpus, um, which is the latest and largest corpus of written text of modern Estonian. It covers a larger time span from 1990 to 2021. And the same for Slovene, we use a reference corpus, uh, the latest version of Gigafida, Gigafida 2.0, which also has got a larger time span than the timestamped corpus and from 1991 to 2018. So for Estonian and Slovene, the source corpora have been carefully compiled in the context of other projects and they have rich metadata and advanced annotation. Whereas for Dutch, the source corpora are completely automatically compiled web corpora, so without any human curation. Uh, it's important to take this into account as this um, may have an influence on the quality of the extracted sentences, which may again um, reflect on the quality of the final data set for these languages. For instance, for Dutch, uh, we have issues with the separable compound verbs. Uh, there were errors in lemmatization as well as tagging errors. And yeah, those were uh, corrected in the manual annotation for as much as possible when, and were needed. So then the next step on the next slide is that we defined pedagogically oriented GoodEx configurations. Tanara already mentioned GoodEx. GoodEx stands for Good Dictionary Examples, and it's a function in Sketch Engine that attempts to automatically sort the sentences according to how likely they are to be good candidates for example sentences. It does this based on a set of predefined quantifiable criteria, such as sentence length, uh, the frequency of words, uh, the absence or presence of certain elements in the sentence, and this is then defined in the form of a rule-based formula, as shown on the next slide, that assigns a numerical score to each of the corpus sentences based on how well it meets these predefined criteria. 
And within this formula, you can see two uh, groups of classifiers, the hard classifiers and the soft classifiers. The hard classifiers serve to severely penalize the sentence, basically separating the good example sentences from the really bad example sentences, whereas then the soft classifiers here at the bottom of the formula uh, uh, penalize or slightly penalize or give bonuses to sentences. And therefore, they are more used, uh, used for ranking the qualitatively more similar sentences. So, yeah, and you see that 50% of the overall score is attributed here to the hard classifiers. So if it's not a whole sentence, then um, it's set to zero, meaning that, yeah, the score is going severely uh, down. And where the soft classifiers at the bottom, for instance, the optimal interval, if the sentence is outside of this optimal interval, there is a linear decrease, but it's not uh, zero straight away. So while um, yeah, general good X configurations have been created by the Sketch Engine team for many languages, um, they can be specifically fine-tuned to better fit different purposes. And for our purpose, we um, defined but more pedagogically oriented good X configurations. But we did, of course, take advantage of our experience with using good X in various lexicographic projects. So let's briefly look at these classify, um, configurations that we have created for the CROWL project. Uh, first on this slide, the hard classifiers. And here we see that um, they are used almost consistently in the configurations for the four languages. Uh, this makes, uh, yeah, this makes sense. As for pedagogical purposes, it's crucial that only whole sentences are extracted from the source corpus, that these sentences are not too long, as very long sentences can compromise intelligibility. It's also important to filter out certain characters, such as tags, as these are not considered appropriate uh, for language learning. And typos, spelling, misspellings, and rare words are also not wanted, and they can be filtered out by setting a minimum frequency for the tokens. When we then look at the soft classifiers, we see that there's more variation among the different languages, but still there's a large overlap. Uh, for instance, optimal sentence length and gray list are used in all of the four configurations. However, we should note that the number of words in the gray list uh, used for the different languages uh, differs significantly per language. Slovene and Estonian have far longer lists and penalize more words than Dutch and Portuguese. However, for the manual annotation, we were particularly interested in the gray area, so it doesn't matter too much, but we may have to refine the configurations for Dutch and Brazilian Portuguese before we uh, use them to assign good X scores to the whole corpus. So that was for the good X configuration. And now, yeah, the far more interesting part, I think, <laughs> the creation of the lemma list and the manual annotation. So, Stella. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes, uh, so obviously our task was multilingual and multilingual here means that we have four different languages we are working with. And we wanted to ensure at least partially comparable results after the manual annotation. So we decided to create a lemma list for data extraction. We selected 100 lemmas in English and then translated them to all participating languages. We selected 50 nouns, 25 verbs, 25 adjectives to have some um, variety uh, pertaining to part of speech. And of course, we selected from three different um, categories of vocabulary. Type A were words or lemmas that were clearly offensive or vulgar. For example, nigger, whore, retarded, to piss, to fuck. The hypothesis here was that um, corpus examples with this vocabulary would probably end up being labeled as vulgar, offensive, or otherwise problematic for pedagogic use. On the other side of the specter, we included uh, type C, 20 non-problematic lemmas. We sourced those from the most frequent words in our corpora, for example, new year, to say, to see. 
again, the hypothesis here was that these should not be labeled too often. Um, and in the middle, we have the type B, which we refer to the gray zone, the gray vocabulary. Here, we um, selected 60 lemmas that were offensive or vulgar, but only in certain senses of the word, or they were related to some potentially sensitive content. Some examples, drunk, suicide, fanatic, depressed, to molest. On the next slide, we can see um, an example of our selection. But uh, first, maybe to answer the question, um, how did we choose what potentially sensitive topics were? Uh, we looked uh, basically into three um, areas of previous research. One is uh, hate speech. So we try to identify um, target, uh, hate speech usually targets certain groups or uh, human features such as race, sexual orientation, religious political beliefs, um, handicap, and similar. Secondly, we looked, as uh, already mentioned, we looked at lexicographic practices uh, pertaining to labeling, um, vocabulary, so obviously um, dictionary entries that uh, are that are very powerfully um, negatively that have a negative connotation would be labeled and we looked at that at the practices there and thirdly uh, we also have some um, practical experience with building language games uh, to be used in the classroom and there we had um, for example a very concrete task of eliminating collocations and synonyms that could be disturbing or triggering uh, for kids. So we also found some sensitive topics such as violence, illness, death, addiction, sex, excretions, and similar. So we started with that. Um, here is an example, as I said, on the right. Uh, as you can see in the first column, we have um, these topical categories like race, sexual orientation, violence, etc. Then the type of the word, um, the English word, for example, um, racist, nigger, lesbian, faggot, or whatever. Part of speech and all the four um, translations to, to, to the four participating languages. So while this uh, final product, the final lemma list looks very nice and neat, uh, I can show on the next slide, we had quite uh, a lot of translation challenges, uh, probably if there are some translators among the listeners, they will uh, understand that it was, it was difficult to find um, English uh, lemmas that would neatly translate in all four languages uh, and be similar in form, meaning, connotation and frequency. And this is what we strived to uh, achieve. We had to go back to the table many times, uh, maybe change the, the English word with something easier to translate uh, in such a nice way. Here are some examples of the differences we made. Um, the first one, for example, we wanted to have all the translations as uh, single word units because that would ease the extraction of corpus examples in the next step. So we had to change to fuck off into to fuck because that was that gave us better results in, in the four languages. Similar, I don't know, Bimbo, for example, didn't have a nice suitable translation in Portuguese, so we changed it to a little more offensive slut that translated nicely. Uh, transsexual uh, had uh, very little um, uh, corpus hits, concordances in, in the Dutch corpus, so we changed it to transgender, which is highly more highly rep represented and similar. In, in, in all the steps, we, we really tried also to choose um, the translations that were semantically the most precise. So in, in cases we had to choose, we, we were very careful to, to choose the, the, the semantically more precise translation. On the next slide, um, we can see what we did with the lemma list after it was finalized. Uh, 
as uh, Carol said before, we, we used it together with the GUDEX uh, configuration to extract the sentences from our corpora. For um, each of the lemmas, we uh, extracted 200 examples and 100 of those per lemma were then annotated. That means 10,000 corpus examples for each of the participating languages. As Tanara mentioned before, we, we tried annotating in two um, consecutive steps. First, we decided whether the example was uh, non-problematic or problematic for pedagogical use. And secondly, we tried to label the type of the problem or problems if there were more than one. I will now give you uh, some examples on the next slide um, of annotated sentences to give you an idea of what all of these categories um, approximately meant to us. So offensive, uh, the example here is the less they think about faggots, the better. Clearly, uh, also the, the second one, uh, vulgar. Just now I took a break and stopped jerking off. These, these are clearly examples that we would like to flag and let teachers um, decide whether they want to show this, uh, whether they want to use it in the classroom or not. Then we have our most exciting category, sensitive. Uh, a lot of work was done here, a lot of cooperation between us, a lot of fine tuning of the um, annotation guidelines, as we will see uh, on the next couple of slides. An, an example here uh, marked as sensitive is, as he said himself, he used the money to buy alcohol and candy. So we can see here we have um, uh, occurring this uh, topic, alcohol, alcohol use, um, and then together with candy, this can be maybe a sign that a kid was buying alcohol. So we, we opted to, to uh, mark this as sensitive. Then we have errors, uh, this uh, Mislim da bila bolana. Here we have a spelling error in Slovene. And lacking context, um, that is also pretty subjective. Um, and here, I think, an, an very, a very interesting starting point for future research into um, how to define enough context for pedagogical and lexicographic use. For example, here we have in one big bright red book where we can probably agree that some important content is missing for this to be really useful. Now, uh, after we have uh, seen these categories a little better, um, I think we should uh, repeat the exercise with the group. So here the, the, we will have four uh, sentences, one after another, and we will have to label them for problem, okay? Let's yeah, look at sure. what we have, 19. Okay, we have this one. Here, more people said no problem. Some are saying offensive, sensitive, lack of content. Okay, yeah, here the examples are of course selected not to be the easiest. So it's expected that we have a little different opinions. Okay, next one and the last one. This is really, really nice. It really showcases why the crowdsourcing part of this labeling will be essential for our future research because these are exactly the, the, the areas that call for further examination. So all of these four mm, examples we voted on were labeled sensitive in, in our uh, task. So we decided they were sensitive after discussing what sensitive is for our specific purposes. So again, we're repeating this is relatively um, subjective, um, however, we wanted to have a unified uh, data set. 
especially inside language and then of course across the languages. So we did try to find some, some um, areas where we can further unify our decisions um, regardless of how we initially maybe felt about um, this sensitivity. So here, for example, apart from all these topics we were talking about um, a couple of slides before, we uh, discovered that when family members um, are presented like uh, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, and so on, we are more prone to labeling something as sensitive. Also, when teenagers and teenager behavior were featured in the examples, we would lean more towards go for the sensitive just in case you know give this decision to the teachers um, instead of letting them slip uh, through uh, also interestingly um, um, the um, sarcastic humorous examples that were taken out of context for example like this one about the social acceptability of drinking alcohol um, and statistics or facts that were taken out of um, content as well. So here we don't know what these experts are. Is this, do they really exist or is this just some sarcastic comment to some pre-existing debate? That is why this one ended up in the sensitive um, uh, basket, so to speak. Uh, we also, of course, faced our own bias when we were annotating for sensitivity and that was really interesting to notice um, especially when we were labeling uh, um, some politically or ideologically uh, related statements um, maybe we were more likely to label sensitive when we didn't agree with the political argument or the political ideology presented. So we had to be very careful to then go back to the data and try to be fair and not let too much bias in. But again, this is a very subjective uh, task and that is exactly why we want to continue with crowdsourcing and further explore um, these decisions and why different people would make different decisions here. Uh, we included uh, this table in the presentation uh, just to show you that um, we did a relatively good job and uh, we believe we made a good decision with the unified lemma list. Um, a lot of these uh, numbers show they are similar, which is um, very comforting to know that we, we have comparable results. There are also some outliers. And this again gives us a, a nice opportunity to go back to the data and see what went, uh, what happened in specific parts of data sets um, and we can conduct further analysis and um, maybe figure out some new things about the data extraction and the annotation and the, I would say, um, feasibility and reachability of the goals that we have set for ourselves in the first place. Now the, the next slide um, gives a little sneak peek into the results. These are the tables with uh, annotated data you will find on uh, Portul and Clarin, as Tanara mentioned before. We also have a paper that provides a little more details on how we um, pro uh, prepared the GoodX uh, configurations, the lemma list, and what we extracted. So the next slide and the last from uh, Carol and I, how will this annotated data be used? As Tanara said before, to kick off the crowdsourcing game and uh, the rest of the team will give a lot of explanation on how we plan to do that uh, with a little demo of the game as well. Secondly, uh, as a reference point for experiments with automated annotation or categorization, we are currently examining how ChatGPT performs for this task. Um, however, um, seeking the opinions of the community will remain our main focus as we want to study the consensus or non-consensus on sensitive issues and the idea of sensitivity and labeling sensitivity to begin with. Thank you from both of us. 
We can now move to the first Q and A. Okay. I ask whether the final data set only stores a single label, the most frequent one, or do you also store, in addition, those actual counts or the ratio, because that would be more fine-grained information that if you don't want to use it, you, you don't. But if you somehow want to have a more granular understanding, the information will be there. So you don't you don't need to really say whether it's... Um, I mean, you can okay uh, store the most frequent one, but the information is there about the disagreement and all that. Yeah, spot on one. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. For the for the data sets that are labeled and published at the moment, the one and only annotation is provided because this was the the first step. But when we go to crowdsourcing and we will have multiple answers, we will definitely export all of them so that exactly this uh, interannotation agreement can be examined and we can see where people were very unified, where they were completely heterogeneous in their opinions and similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Ah, Hank, yes, I see your hand. Yes, I do have a question as well. I remember that you that you said uh, somewhere in the beginning of your talk <clears throat> that you would um, uh, send the uh, label sentences to a machine learning uh, algorithm. And at the end of uh, Spela's talk, there was talk about uh, chat GPT. So is the idea that you would like to uh, develop your own classifier? Yeah, I would say that originally, in uh, when we thought about stage three, that was the idea. I kind of skipped a little bit because I was running uh, out of time, but we wanted to have uh, two different algorithms, one for uh, binary identification, so identification of problematic or not problematic, and then identification of the type of problems. Uh, and then we think this is still viable in, 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 in an interesting idea, even though now there is ChatGPT there, uh, who theoretically could do that, but uh, we are uh, experimenting on that and uh, we still want to take, as uh, Spela said, the uh, the label from people. Yeah, so we, we do know that this is people, these are people telling us what they think about this and this and not the machine. But yes, the, the idea is to develop this, uh, uh, probably a classifier, yes. Yeah, I don't so know if... Then you can use ChatGPT as a kind of uh, reference point and see if you can do better, right? And then uh, with, with better, uh, I would say, uh, uh, data that you really know what the data is. And uh, uh, so I think it would be, it, it's a good, uh, good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There's another I don't question, know. I think, in the uh, chat. It is uh, the, sen the sensitive category seems too broad to me. Did you consider more granularity, such as I would not present this sentence to uh, children, women, immigrants? If yes, what were the issues? Well, there were some issues. F first of all, when we decided on five categories and not more than that, that's because of other studies have shown that we have to be careful about uh, cognitive load. So we cannot, since this is a game, uh, we cannot go into too many uh, details and too many categories. Um, as we were annotating, we were also thinking like, oh, ah, yeah, I wish I could say this or I could, or, I, I like, uh, I don't know, for instance, well, it's not actually, it's not about a, a mistake. It, it, it's a, an error. It's just that this is informal or this is a more an oral thing. And then we, well, we can't really annotate that. And and that was a decision that we had to make because of the game. So uh, we know, we acknowledge this as a limitation, but we wanted to uh, think about the cognitive load. And that would be the same thing about your suggestion. Yeah, it would be very nice to be very more to the point and specific, but for the game, it wouldn't be uh, 
user friendly it wouldn't be it would be too uh heavy Isabella? we also we we have one very clear scenario so we have the language learning scenario yeah. and that is also to help people narrow down everything they could possibly decide on so we want to put them into into this one i don't know judging for 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 a specific reason uh, that i think also led us to to these five categories okay so this we will start to show you the game so we basically will have two parts I will show uh, users' point of view, players' point of view, and here we have actually someone playing game and we have a recording of playing the game. And the second part that Christina and Itzuk will present, we will talk about researcher or manager point of view, which is another user at our game and what can be done and how we can um, have our judgment and what we can do and what we can check and how we can add additional language and so on. So basically here we have an enter, entrance to the game and we have a, a flex for our languages and we have English and I will show it in English for the purpose that it will be uh, suitable for everyone to understand. We have several informed consent uh, uh, forms and it's written um, on the entry oh. page and on the second page and so on. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, to enter the game, we have several login options. So the user basically can choose which option he or she prefer. So the uh, usual login is the user ch uh, chooses email and password. And this password can be different from his regular account. Sign up via email. So here the user has to enter email and uh, password, but there is also additional questions about who our user is, the age, uh, is it language teacher, yes, no, but those questions are not compulsory. The most simplistic sign-in and the most popular currently in games is sign-in via Google. So you continue with your Google account and the continue as a guest. Now I, I decided to continue as a guest. So you can see the entrance level and you can see that we have leaderboards and we will continue to the leaderboards now. Uh, Tanara, can you stop it for a second, just uh, mm -hmm. for me to finish with the leaderboard? So basically we have leaderboards of players and leaderboards of countries. Since the idea is that we are playing the game, we decided to have some gamification elements. And since it is a serious game, actually we don't have so, so much fun. So we tried to end uh, some enthusiasm and some play. So basically users getting points and they can see themselves at the leaderboard. Uh, users get badges and uh, each time you have more points, you can continue to the next badge. But also we had the leaderboards for international competition by countries. So the idea that maybe uh, some countries will be <laughs> Uh, happy to participate in this uh, uh, game to uh, earn more points and to move uh, their country higher. So uh, I will continue with the game. Basically, we have th six levels of the game, and I will show all of the six uh, uh, levels of the game. So the first level is the basic one where the user is asked to give his judgment about two sentences, and the idea is uh, to show if the sentence is appropriate or inappropriate for teaching English. So basically the, the question is, is this question uh, good for teaching English? And we have several options uh, to choose. Uh, we can mark the uh, one of the sentences and uh, click choose. 
we can uh, choose none of them and we can uh, choose um, both of them. So since we can have both sentences unappropriate. At level one, I don't have to explain my choice. So I'm automatically giving next par after I choose. If uh, I choose similar to previous users, I get some points, but I don't want to talk about points here. So basically the idea is that you are judge judging the sentence, uh, which one is appropriate, inappropriate. Here we have a level two of the game. I'm giving a sentence and I will have to explain my choice, not my choice. I can get also choice of previous user. So I'm giving a sentence that someone judged uh, and I now can or oh, have to give to choose several, one of several categories. And please pay attention that the last category is can be that the sentence is fine. So basically I've got the wrong sentence. Uh, we have a question mark, so we can check what is offensive, what, what is vulgar, what is sensitive content. We can have an example. And basically, after we mark the sentence and we continue, we created some kind of labeling or annotation for the sentence that we were giving. And once again, automatically we move to the next uh, level or next sentence. So here we can see the level one and two together. So basically, and here, if you pay attention in the upper corner, Tanar, can you stop the presentation? You can see the points given to the user. So basically after playing uh, five rounds and making choices that are similar to previous users, the user gets uh, points. And uh, here five points were given since probably user played five uh, sentences in a row. So now we are continuing, uh, thank you, to the level one and two together. So basically it's a combination of what we saw before. So I'm in uh, enlarging <laughs> the fonts for this presentation. So we are giving two sentences and we have to uh, do some judgment. One, uh, there is no correct or incorrect choice here. So it's user's decision what to say, what to choose, what to mark. And But here at the level one and two, after uh, the user uh, made the decision, he or she has to explain his decision and to give some labeling or some annotation. Once again, we have the same categories, but we, for both of sentences, if we, we choose that both sentences were inappropriate, and then uh, we can uh, uh, continue. And once again, the next pair of sentences is given automatically. And the user can decide that he or she wants to uh, go to the next level or choose the level or go to the previous level. So choose level is actually very, very simple in this game. So once again, if the user is tired uh, from one kind of labeling, he can move to another kind of labeling. Level three, we think it's the most demanding level of the game. So here uh, we have user choosing the third option, directly goes to the third option. The user is already given a sentence and the categories that it was marked or annotations that was given for, for this sentence. And the user has to mark offensive, in this case, uh, or, or content. So basically we are marking uh, the offensive part and we can save it. Or once again, we can tell that this sentence doesn't have any problem. So we can uh, not answer uh, to it. And if, um, if the user doesn't mark anything and continue, we have a error message. 
I think I, I, we will have it at minute seven of the movie. I don't uh, saw it in a, in a minute we will have it. So basically, once again, the idea is that we are giving the sentence, we are giving the different category. Here is currently vulgar. And we continue. Here is an error message that we have. So I didn't mark anything and I asked to save. And I've got the message from the server that uh, no nothing was marked. So now I will mark the sentence and send, uh, save it. And uh, this selection will work fine. So basically, we have also notification from the system if the user doesn't do the correct uh, action. So basically, Dina, now. Mm -hmm. Dina, sorry, sorry, just very quickly, because Joan asked something and it's related to this. Ah. He asked if we have if people can uh, um, mark different sections, not only. Yes, yes, yes. I, yeah, I think yeah. you, we will have it uh, in mm -hmm. a, in a moment where I will mark three parts because three parts together had a problem. Uh, so basically, we can uh, jump to minute eight, the next section, if you want, because here it's again once again just uh, showing the different uh, possibilities of annotation. And the most difficult level is one, two, and three together. So basically, in uh, if the user goes to the level one plus two plus three, the user will have to decide if the sentence is appropriate for language teaching, two sentences, if no, for each of the sentence, the user will have to provide annotation or labeling. And for each of the sentence, the user will have to explain his or her choice. So this level is the, the most demanding one. So Tanara, I think we can jump. Uh, ah, we're already jumping. So <laughs> the movie is jumping by itself, so it's OK. Uh, so once again, uh, this is the most difficult level from our point of view. So here is the first stage, uh, two sentences automatically provided to the user. So the user first has to choose selection. Once again, any of the sentence, none of them or, or both of them. According to the selection, he will have to explain what was wrong with the sentences in case that some one of the sentence was incorrect or both of the sentence were incorrect. And after choosing the categories, the user will, after annotation, the user will have to explain. And uh, during this explanation, the user will have to mark different parts of the sentence to show what was uh, incorrect. So here uh, it was a little bit slower to show that some sentences can be everything inside. So everything can be wrong. So now the user has to provide the explanation. And in this sentence, maybe each of the word is not offensive, but the combination of the words is the really offensive. So basically, here the three markings were done by the user to show why it was um, uh, offensive. Tanara, can you stop the screen for a second? A little bit? Yeah. So from gamification point of view, since we want our users to continue playing, and sometimes it's boring just to make the judgment so we have several pop-up windows uh, in the random uh, positioning of the game. So sometimes user get, get some encouragements, how many percentage of the users that think the same, what happens in his country, how many points the user have to move to, to the next uh, badge, and so on. So here is basically the gamification element to make our serious game more game-like. So Tanara, please continue. Thank you. And um, here is another example of the same. 
So here we have, let's say, a more gray list like drugs and alcohol, alcohol, given as an example. So once again, each user can decide difficultly, di uh, differently what was correct or incorrect. Once again, we don't think there is correct or incorrect answer. So the idea is that the users will provide the judgment. After choosing the, after selection, we have to annotate uh, to provide labeling. And then once again, we will have to explain what was uh, wrong. So some marking uh, should be done. And um, I think basically we showed all uh, the possibilities of playing the game, all the six levels. And um, that's the user's point of view. And uh, if it's okay, we will continue to manager and the researcher point of view of the game. It's top. So when you are preparing the game, this is the admin interface that you see. So on the in the left hand, you have various options that you can choose from. I will present the ones that are sort of the the language preparation and sentence input, and Christina will then follow with the basically the answers that you get from the users and the user information. Uh, yes, we can continue with the next slide. So here we are going to the languages uh, submenu and we can go to the next slide. So as you can see, there are currently five languages uh, available, uh, the four languages of the participating researchers. And we of course had to develop English as well for demonstration purposes. It's not currently um, sort of, it's not being separately developed, but whenever we go to any conference, of course, we have to provide the English version as well for easier understanding. So here we will look in more detail um, into the Slovene version. And basically you have to provide uh, the flag as well. So it's easier to identify, but you can add it also other information. So we, uh, we can go to the next slide. So basically here you provide uh, the language that uh, you are um, translating for. And below, is this is the notification text um, and it goes further down, but basically you are providing the introductory te text that the user sees whenever they enter the game for the first time. And on the next slide, we have I have the screenshot of, the, um, of that uh, particular um, website. So we can go on, yes. So this is, basically what you are, what you have provided in the admin and it's visible here. Um, and uh, it's sometimes more useful to see it here than because then you can even edit it. You can say, I want to put it in bold. I want to shorten it. I want to move it in position. I mean, I'm speaking from our experience because that's exactly what we did during the development. Uh, yes, we can continue. So the, there is much more for the language version, which uh, applies to the parts of the game. So this is the translation part. Um, we can go to the next slide. So um, this is where it gets a bit more um, uh, in sort of separate. So you are actually translating each and separate segment of the game. In this case, uh, in these columns that you can see in the left column, it's the sort of a, a short label or description. It can be a longer text, but you can, as you can see, it, uh, the information on the username, so username in the left-hand column, and then there are five different translations in each of the five languages. Uh, and by clicking on edit, you can then edit each of that translations and enter a new one. And you do that for every part of the game. That you, you, they can all, Whenever there's a, uh, during the development, there were new parts added um, every week almost, and then we had to translate that as well. So there were even parts of, of certain languages that were still empty. Um, and as can be seen by the date, uh, for example, here you had the uh, 7th of February, but then there were some updates done even later. Uh, 
And uh, this is the part that uh, Rina showed earlier. So these are the badges where you actually uh, define um, the, uh, the type of levels that the users ca can achieve, the number of points for each level, and then you can change the image, so the, low, the icon of a particular badge. Uh, in the settings, um, you can, again, uh, provide this general um, notification, but the important parts are at the top. So this is where um, uh, the game provides you with, uh, I mean, you can adapt these settings. One, the top one is when is each example finished? So when is it done? And this is the, the basically the difference defined at the moment. So let's say, if you get a ratio of uh, five answers for OK and two answers for not OK, that's already enough because the difference between um, the approved and not approved is, is three or more. And then the example gets marked as done. And below is the number of cycles that the guest user, so the user who is not registered, can play before it's asked for registration. Uh, and prevent it for further play. Yes. Um, okay. And now the final part that I'll present is the sentences. So here you can see that uh, this is the information on all the data that is currently in this game. Uh, so we can so continue. So this is, you can see at the top, you have uh, 12,943 sentences at the moment in uh, the database. And you you have you get provided with the example itself, the language, the good score for the example, whether it's finished or not, and the status. So currently, of these six sentences displayed here, one is included in the game, and the rest are still waiting for the others to be finished. Um, now, on the in the left hand, you can see oh, just a bit. Um, just to back more, yes, in the left hand, you can see you can actually manually input the sentence. So if I wanted, I would put type a sentence here or copy it from somewhere, choose the language, good score, and save it. But of course, that's really not that practical. So we want to um, do a mass import. And now we can go to the next slide. So you prepare a CSV file uh, with these particular columns. Um, providing the uh, the census itself, but also some ID information, which will later enable you to match this particular sentence with the answers provided by the uh, players. Uh, these are the particular ID um, um, that we are looking at is the last two, uh, the, the column source token number and source ID. At least one of the two has to be provided. Uh, the source token number is the one that is usually obtained from the uh, corpus, in this case, the sketch engine, whereas the source ID is also here from the sketch engine, but for the Slovene corpus, for example, we have a completely different one, which is uh, unique and it's been assigned separately, so uh, outside of the sketch engine. And the good score has to be provided because the sentences are selected based on it. So it tends to be uh, one, from the good part, so from uh, above 0 0.7, I think, and, and one sentence below that um, score. Okay, and and there, there is always a search uh, option available, so you can actually do a search for finished sentences. You can do a search from the whenever they, certain sentences were added, uh, if you or by language. All of these. Um, options are available, so you, one can easily access the sentences maybe to see whether a certain sentences has been already imported, whether it's been already finished, and so forth. So, Christina, you can take over. Okay, thank you. Uh, to see the answers, uh, you must click uh, in, in the admin interface, you must click under comp, comp, uh, you must click components and then answers. And then all the answers that have been provided are shown here. Here you can see the sentences, you can see the languages. Here all the languages that are on the screenshot are from Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. 
Then you can see the user ID, also the user status, whether they are registered or a guest. And you can see what kind of answer was provided, whether it was positive or negative. And you can also click on the answer details. So you can move on to the next slide. Uh, on, the, on the answer details, you can see again the full sentence. You can see the reason it was given, why it was um, annotated as um, problematic. In this case, this sentence is uh, labeled offensive. And also you can see the, sen the bad part in the sentence. So this, I'm not going to pronounce it because I don't know any, any Portuguese, but this part was then labeled um, offensive. And you can also see the, the date when it was annotated. Next slide. Uh, you can also uh, use the search options there under answers. Uh, so you can search for um, for a specific sentence or just uh, one, le one lemma, maybe one word. You can search for a certain word that you are interested in. You can filter the answers by language. Um, there all the languages that there are in the game. Then you can also filter them by positive or, or negative answers. Also, the sentence status Istok just showed. You can uh, search for, um, for example, all the sentences that have been uh, that, have, that have already reached the inter annotator agreement, or the ones that are just newly added, or uh, the ones that are returned to the game. Uh, you can also uh, search by user status, so you can uh, choose whether the um, players are have been registered have registered or are just playing as a guest. And you can also uh, set the time uh, period when uh, the sentences were annotated. And you can analyze the data here in the user interface, but you can also export it to Excel. So when we move on to the next slide, you can see how the Excel looks. So this is these are the Estonian um, sentences for the word uh, nigger. So here you can see on the there are, I think, nine columns. The first one, the language, then the sentence. Here you can also see the user ID. You can see the answer, whether it was positive or negative, and also the reasons uh, why they were um, selected as unsuitable. And also the bad part you can see here, and uh, the sentence source ID and the sentence source token number. So you can track back the sentences in your, in your data. And uh, you can also search uh, information on, on, you can look at the information on users under user interac interac interaction, uh, under users, you can see the list of users uh, by ID numbers, mm, also the status, whether they are active or not, and when the when was the account created. And you can also look at more details when you click on the edit button, but you can also delay the user. When you click on the edit button, then you can see Yes, next slide. You can see what the user, um, what kind of information did they provide for them, themselves. So this uh, user is below 20, so a young player. And uh, they are not a language teacher, but uh, they are probably then studying at, at a university on uh, uh, learning some kind of language, some language or, or linguistics. And uh, this, uh, mm, that the, this language that they're playing is their dominant language or first language. And uh, next slide. Uh, you can also export the user data in an Excel format. And here you can also see the same data. Uh, you have the user ID, you have their age, uh, you have uh, answers on whether uh, they are uh, working as a teacher, whether they um, whether they are have a degree in language or linguistics uh, and whether this language is their dominant language. And also you can see here the language that they uh, are playing. So you can then um, also map these user IDs to the data and then anal analyze, uh, an analyze the answers. Are there any more questions or comments? Can I ask another question? Um, that's about the user moderation. Um, so how do you avoid that uh, you attract the wrong people as users and uh, then again, you get the spoiled database? Uh, currently, we, have, we can have malicious users and we don't know. But basically, if the user uses the same username and the same account, we can find, if we analyze the data and see that user is all the time 
giving the wrong uh, wrong answers, we, we can check. But currently we can have a group of malicious users organizing and uh, spoiling all the data set. So from uh, information security point of view, we are assuming that all users are good users. <laughs> That's very friendly. <laughs> but, I mean, um, when when this uh, site gets very popular, uh, I think the experiences will change. Uh, and then perhaps you have to uh, kind of uh, have a registration uh, uh, page or so. No, but That's since it. we are keeping all the data, it will be relatively easy and possible to yes. check who malicious user were and delete their answers. Yes, I see. Thank you. Uh, is there a URL of the game? Uh, maybe it was on your slides, yes. but I didn't see yeah, it. Okay. I think Tam Tanara will give it. To uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, sure. Yes. Um, yeah, but just to make sure, Hank, we do have registration, right? So... Uh -huh. uh, uh, we do have the registration of the uh, people can play as a guest only up to five uh, uh, plays. Um, they cannot choose different levels. So it's just for them to have a taste. And then when this is over, we, they are asked to register. Right. Uh, so we do have, uh, we do ask people to, to, to register. However, uh, the email address is only kept for uh, finding the password in case you need to reset password so we don't have access this is saved automatically in the yes. database we don't we don't see it and uh, the names that people choose is just for a username on the leaderboard so you can choose a nickname or you can give your real name if you want to it's up to you but we don't see that as you might have seen we just see a number yep. we don't even see the nickname um so yes um and uh, now we are in the beta version because uh, we are still, we have asked some, uh, like a, a small pilot test. I mean, with people uh, we know to give us some feedback on potential crashes or some bugs or something that is still not uh, ready. And then once we have gone through this final phase of finishing up this final touches, which is basically, we are nearly there. Uh, then we will public release uh, the game and advertise widely so that we can, uh, and of course, in order to do that, we will, because right now we are using the data sets that we have created with our annotation and everything and several times, yes, because I myself, I, I can log in as three different users so that I can know what's going on. So we're going to get rid of that and have only our corpora that have been uh, manually annotated by us as a kickstart for the game and then start the game. So it will be very soon that we'll have that. Thank you. I do have more questions, but let's first uh, have, uh, let's see if others do have questions. <laughs> uh, I didn't uh, uh, notice uh, while entering the presentation, but uh, is a user interface uh, language also uh, choosable? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, everything is translated. So basically the Excel um, sheets uh, that currently in the game uh, and is shown, each sentence that used in the game is translated to, uh, to the language of playing. Each choice, it's each ex explanation, everything. So this is what you see. I think it was Christian who asked. Yeah, he's uh, Estonian, so you can you can maybe click Estonian. <laughs> ah, okay, right. <laughs> so you you get to this page, uh, and then you choose your language. And the moment you choose a language, uh, you get everything in your language. Um, and then you can have. You can try, so as you can see, the the guest mode is only the three levels, one after the other. So one, two, three, you cannot pick any other one. And then you, you continue. Um, and just something out of a curiosity, if you click here, you get to our project page which I will also further 
advertise, but if you want to get to, to read our publications and everything. So this is clickable from uh, our logo here in the game. So let me just come home. And then again, yes, English is here now for demonstration purposes, but we haven't uh, followed all the methodological steps for English because English is not one of the languages that we are working. So we did a smaller sample uh, uh, set of data and everything just for just for demonstration purposes. Can I add something? I think it was pointed out before, but maybe again, we all the steps of our work are created in such a way that new languages should easily be added, or at least easily enough be added. Mm -hmm. So we are we are creating this uh, pipeline where another researcher for an, interested in an, adding another language could come, and also, for example, in the system shown by Istok and Christina, there is a way to add translations, to translate the interface to a new language, add a new flag, and then, you know, set up the entire process for, yeah. for another one. Yeah. And, and we are very enthusiastic about <laughs> new yeah. other languages yeah, joining yeah. this. Mm. Um, maybe a strange question, but um, the, the input that you receive and all these scores and marks of, of the sentences, who is the owner or the right holder of this? Uh... Of, the, of what, of the sentences? Or... Yeah, so in the end, you will have a database with all the, um, with all the uh, labels by all these uh, participants. Um, and is it clear to the participants that you are the owner of, of, of this or uh, how is this arranged? I ask this for a specific reason, because one of the very interesting applications that you now can think of, um, you were mentioning the um, machine learning aspect and building your own classifier. But there's a complete other twist to it is by saying that you have, um, in fact, um, filtered uh, uh, many relevant databases that are um, also very interesting as um, constituents of a large language model. So um, you have a very interesting database now and uh, in the future even more interesting for builders of large language models for which you, because the big problem with these large language models is that they trained with malicious data um, and you have the advantage that one, you have a filter version and you know exactly what kind of data you have. So um, there is a, say, a business aspect to it, which mm. uh, you may not underestimate, I think. And that's why I ask for the, for the right holdership of the information that is now collected. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what we do say here is that uh, uh, the, the data will be kept securely in the server of the University of Coimbra and will be used for research purposes only. So this is uh, our information because we, we don't want to, I mean, this is a, a game uh, funded by our institutions, by clearing. So it's all open source and everything. So it's not our intention at all to make money out of it. It's to make it as a open access and accessible to everyone as well. Yes. And still the interesting thing remains that also for academic purposes, you can build large language models, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask, Hank, what would you suggest then in terms of who is the owner of the data, the annotated data? I mean... Yeah. We always assumed we would contribute to Claren as we did with the manual annotated data set. And I think we had the same in mind for additional new versions of this database with more yeah, annotation. Yes, actually. So uh, it, it is a question that c comes up to my mind now as well. Yeah. So I think we have to, to think this over uh, because yeah. it's an interesting uh, question, I think. Mm -hmm. But yes, your suggestions are welcome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. We will think Definitely, about it. Definitely, yes. Yes, yes.
Um, you also said you had a funding from the Clarion Resource Family uh, mm -hmm. Fund. Um, if if we would go to the Clarion Resource Family page, uh, which which resource uh, would you can can we find you, or is this still one to be added to the uh, to the page uh, as a tool, for example? Actually, uh, we had the funding from Clarion Resources Families funding, but we added the all the corpora annotation guidelines and the lemma list in Portland Clarion. Ah, right. So it you need to go to Portland Clarion yes. to access it. Yeah. Although uh, what you're saying is something that I, it had crossed my mind before, which is yes. maybe there should be some kind of link. Um, yeah, on the, the for the tools yeah. part, maybe Francesca has a suggestion. I think I can ask them that they've recently asked to update the list of resource families. I think I can ask them to add um, your resource, but it has to fit into one of the families. This is not uh, L2 Learner Corpora. This is not mm -hmm. anything like that. I, I'm not sure. It's annotated data set, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. kind of catch all. Uh, if I can't find a better one, but I'll ask uh, Tanara, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. in which category or uh, we can fit this one. But at least annotated corpora, it can fit there, I guess. Francesca? Uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, also was also my suggestion. It, it is an annotated corpus, uh, at the very least, uh, not an L2 corpus. Uh, of course, uh, this we have the experience of Parliament. So the idea of going beyond the resource families and uh, really created sets of uh, parallel resources. And uh, personally, I really enjoyed the presentation and this, uh, this the work that you have done is uh, really commendable. And uh, it I would like to see the list of languages grow. Uh, so I don't know if you have a workflow or something that... Uh, can help others to contribute to your project. Yeah, we are preparing that. We have uh, we are preparing uh, instructions for admins, so which means people who want to participate. So how to access and how to go about, and it's in the making. But yes, if anyone is interested, just get in touch, and uh, I can share what, whatever we have already and give some uh, tutoring uh, help at any time. We know this by heart. We haven't mentioned here, but um, we do have, uh, we use FreedCamp, which is a project management tool to keep contact with the programmer. So whatever we have any problems, any bugs or whatever, we just send the tickets there so this person would also be this person or these people would also be added there to get in the loop of the conversation. Uh, so yeah, that would be really nice. Warmest greetings from Albania. I am a lecturer in uh, Hanoli University in Korcha in Albania. Uh, this presentation was really interesting because we uh, get to know uh, step by step uh, the different uh, stages of the project and uh, this the development of corpora uh, in Albania is uh, at an infancy stage so people are still um, there are few few uh, scholars who are dealing with this so I would ask I have many questions but I can't ask them all um, uh, have you considered Albanian language to be added to this uh, corpora? No problem. If we will have an Albanian researcher uh, who is willing to translate uh, the required text, yes, I think no problem. Yes, Tanara? Yeah. yeah. I thought I was going to say something. Please. Yeah, I well, I, I wanted to just uh, say what Rina already said. I mean, we, we will we welcome any language However, we need a, a person or, or a team on the other side that will prepare the data, translate, so do all the things that we cannot do. So we can provide support in terms of uh, instructions and uh, advice on, on data preparation, but everything else the researchers have to do um, because then you are looking at uh, your own language material, uh, May you may have some own, own preferences in the way the data is prepared or um, all the, these things, but yes. 
Thank you. All right. I think uh, we are coming to an end of this, uh, Claire and uh, Cafe. I'd like to point to uh, uh, one contribution by Francesca uh, related to my uh, question about the, the right holders issue. Uh, there's a, a perspectivist uh, uh, approach to this, um, and, and maybe the link is interesting for all of us to have a look at. Um, ah, okay. So let's go to the, to the next uh, slide uh, then, which will yes, be a yes. closing. Yeah. Um, I think we had a very good Claren Cafe, by the way, with very interesting presentations, uh, giving lots of interaction. So thank you, uh, organizers, for that. Uh, we are very grateful uh, to have such a nice, uh, I've had such a nice Claren Cafe. Um, here is, uh, uh, say, our last commercial. <laughs> uh, it gives an idea of uh, what, what uh, Claren has. And uh, uh, I'd like to point you to uh, the things that we also have in terms of next event. Uh, we, we expect to have a, a next Claren Cafe on translation technologies and workflows for uh, SSH researchers. Um, there are a couple of very interesting uh, workshops we, ha we will have at the LREC Coling. Um, um, a conference uh, next month in in uh, uh, Turin, I think it is. Um, and please stay tuned uh, for the Claren Cafes. Uh, there's the link here. Uh, and there's also on the Claren page uh, a link to all events that uh, Claren is uh, organizing. Okay. okay. Hank, sorry, I just forgot because we were talking in the discussion and I didn't realize. I just wanted to show very quickly, super, super quick, <laughs> uh, I just want to give uh, the acknowledgements also to our, because we got funding from our own institutions and uh, in, in addition to Claring, so from the Foundation for Science and Technology in Portugal, uh, from the Slovenian Research Agency, from the Stern Estonian Research Council grant, and also the Dutch Language Institute and European Academic Center, so it's important to acknowledge their support. and. This is something that I wanted to show. So the, if you want more information on our project uh, and the blog and also the portal on clearing, but I have already shared before the game, so you can also see that. Oh, sorry. And, and that's just what I wanted to say. Sorry that I didn't say it earlier, but I'm very happy. No, I but think it was a good one. It is relevant uh, for sure. And uh, I'm sure David will edit it in nicely in the final version of this uh, recording. Good. Thank you all for your contributions. It was a wonderful uh, cafe. And I wish you all a very nice evening. Mm -hmm.